I'm going to be speaking to you tonight about the importance of titles and labels. We do live in an age, in a particular time, where uh, it is quite common for people to say things like, um, I just want to be called a Bible-believing Christian. That's the, that's the phrase, if I'm going to have a title, it's just going to be Bible-believing Christian. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to see why we need actually to have some more words when we attempt and set out to articulate the truth of Scripture that God has given to us in His Word. I want to start with 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, which read, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, this is a key text that we as Christians use when we want to talk about what the Bible says about the Bible, that it comes firstly to us from God and what then it is going to do in our lives. Uh, the origin, therefore, of Scripture is God himself, and the intent of Scripture is to equip, to teach you, to correct you, to train you and actually complete the believer for service to the living God. An important implication of this, of this text and understanding that Scripture originates with God is that God then intends for you and I to actually know truth. God is not vague about His Word. He intends for us to be able to hear and receive truth, to know it and be able to recite it, articulate it, and then to teach it to others as well. He doesn't say all scripture is breathed out and at work in you for you to simply be vague and not know anything, to not actually be able to say truth statements and take a hold of God's word that is tangible for us to know truth. We are to therefore have conviction as we come to God's word, to know what he has given to us, to know why he has given it to us, and to know how then to live in a manner that is worthy of him. So truth is to be grasped. Truth is to be held tightly and lived by because God has made his word known to us. Further, God intends for us to know him, to be able to speak about him to each other. So as we consider who we are as Christians, we are people who deal in truth, not simply niceness, not simply vagueness, we are to articulate the truths of Scripture. And so we start with God. And the reason we start with God, we start with Scripture is because our God is the God of revelation. When I say that he is the God of revelation, I don't mean he is the God who has given you the book of revelation. I mean that he is the God who has made himself known to us, uh, that he has revealed who he is, what he is like and what he expects of us. So our entire basis for being Christian is not because we were clever people who discovered God. It's not as though when people say, have you found God, that that's actually a true statement. It is that God has made himself known to us. He is the one who has revealed his truth to us. He is the one who has brought salvation to his people. And he continues to teach us about himself and his purposes. The very coming of Christ, the incarnation demonstrates to us that we have a God who comes to us rather than the other way around. See, the Bible is clear. No one seeks for God. Let me clarify this in terms of the God of revelation. We should understand firstly that creation gives general understanding and knowledge of who God is. In Romans 1, we use Romans 1 a lot here at RBC. It says in verse 18 that for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes. Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So this passage teaches us two things. All people have knowledge of God. However, because of our sin, we suppress the truth. Human beings are truth suppressors. So although human beings are without excuse, there therefore needs to be more revelation from God for us to be able to be saved, for us to be able to articulate specifically the truth about who he is. And God is gracious and merciful, and he hasn't left it 
just at this first stage of revealing himself through creation, he has given us revelation further in a salvific way to bring uh, true knowledge of, of salvation through Christ. And he has done this through the living word and through his son, Jesus Christ. Being then that truth isn't something that we come up with, but rather it is something that has been given to us. And so this means that God intends for people to be able to know and articulate truth, to be able to confess it and tell others about him and his word. It's not arrogant to say, therefore, that here is the truth. We live in a time where people are against having an absolute truth, but truth is what we get from God because he has revealed it. The message, therefore, does not originate with us. We are simply telling the good news as it has been given to us, confessing the truth as it has been told and made known to us from God himself. So we speak and we convey truth. We uh, teach on it as, as it has been given to us to articulate the wonderful truths about our glorious God and his wonderful gospel, salvation in Christ. Uh, we use, therefore titles and labels and even denominational names to help us in this quest to be able to say true things about God. One example of this that we, that we know so well is the use of the word Trinity. Uh, the word Trinity, as we know, doesn't, uh, doesn't, isn't found anywhere in Scripture, yet the teaching of, Trin of the Trinity, the, the, the truth of it, is from Genesis to Revelation. All of Scripture conveys to us the reality of who God is, a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we use a title, we use a word to be able to articulate the truth. See, it's popular today for people to have less concern about these titles and denominational names having this and knowing what that meant has fallen on hard, on hard times. It's popular for people to have less concern for the distinction of their denomination and actually less concern for theology and what the theology of a church is. Instead, they have more concern for other things, particularly when they are looking to a local church and what, what does this church have and that church have that, that will be pleasing to me if I'm looking for a, for a church for my family. And they, in their quest, the three things that I often hear from people are, firstly, that they are looking for a welcoming community. The, 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 the key aim of going to a church and looking for, for a place to stay with your family is if they are a welcoming community. That's high on the list. The second one is music that they like. Uh, that is a search to see whether or not the music is going to be fitting to their taste. And the third one, which is probably ranks higher on, on, on this list, is whether or not the kids and the teenagers are going to connect. In such a case... It's actually sad that what takes place is that the unregenerate, untrained teenager actually chooses for the family where they will go to church. Not mum and dad having studied the positions of the church to be able to say, yes, this is a sound church that aligns with scripture. They look to the teenagers who haven't even come to saving faith yet. In discussions with people over the years, this is the, these are the things that I often hear first and foremost that they are looking at. Now, now, some of that's not, not ultimately bad, right? I mean, being a welcoming community, we can make a biblical case for that. That's good to show hospitality and welcome people in. Uh, having music that doesn't hurt your ears and make you want to claw the person next to you, that's, that's, a, that's a bonus, right? Having, uh, having the teenagers, the kids connect in with the church, fantastic, that's, that's helpful. But is that really the benchmark? In an age where truth is under attack, uh, do those things really make a sound or healthy church? Would it really not matter what the church's theology as long as they were nice people who could play songs well? See, the summary of our Christian faith is not simply nice people and good music and babysitting. The church is called to be the pillar of truth in our world. 1 Timothy chapter 3.15 says, If I delay, this is Paul writing to Timothy, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. I would argue that in our day, our view of the local church and how beautiful it is, is actually at an all-time low, way too low. Hear that text again, the church is... It's the church of the living God. It's his church, a pillar and buttress of the truth. It belongs to God. It represents him, proclaims his truth, proclaims his gospel that rescues somebody from the depths of hell. 
And so the truths that we speak are to be found in Scripture and recited on a regular basis by the church, to the community, to families, and to the world around us. That means that we are supposed to speak with conviction. We are supposed to. We're supposed to know and tell the truth. So titles, labels, uh, names of denominations are going to articulate these truths. They are necessary for it. See, every single church has theology. And they will impart it into you, whether you are aware of it or not. The truth is, theology is unavoidable. Every single Christian does theology every time they open their mouth. When they say something about God, they have said a theological statement. The difference is whether that theology is good or false. Theology is simply words about God or study of God. And all Christians engage with theology the moment we talk about what God is like, about what his word says and what he expects of us. The second consideration for our day is in terms of denominations. Denominations for people can just seem too hard and too difficult. Again, this, this concept of, I don't want to have these type of labels. It's so common for Christians to reject this. Uh, consider this one statement that, that I've heard multiple times, uh, something to this degree. It says Baptist on the building or the website, but that means nothing to me, says one member who has been at a Baptist church for 20 years and still has no idea what it even means. What this type of statement demonstrates is that there is actually a big disconnect from Christian brothers and sisters who paved the way before us. So the denominational me names mean something. They have meant something. Important truths. The names and titles are the human words, yes, but necessary for giving the life-giving truths found within Holy Scripture. To ignore our history as Baptists is foolishness. Yet today, so many Christians live in an isolated world, an isolated Christianity cut off from the ones who came before them, from the history that teaches of the mighty work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of brothers and sisters who came before us. Consider another popular statement, as I mentioned in the beginning. I belong to no denomination. I'm just a Bible-believing Christian, says another long-term Baptist church member. Now, first, it just it sounds like a phrase we, that we all want to use and think maybe that just sounds right. For the sake of unity, let's leave all of these titles and, and these labels. This sounds maybe even more noble and, and just better, maybe. What the person doesn't realize is that Bible-believing Christian has been shared by so many different people, all claiming very, very different truths, all claiming very, very different things. And even heretics and a Jehovah's Witness and a Mormon will claim that I just believe the Bible. So if you're of that uh, understanding and that's where you would like to be, I just want to be a Bible-believing Christian. Are you prepared to be in the same camp as those heretics who will say that I just believe in the Bible as well? Or can you see then that there might be a need for some additional words to help set you apart from the heretics? One man who attended a service told me that he rejected all labels, all creeds and all confessions. He was just a Bible-believing Christian. Well, he turned out to believe that humans are born sinless despite what Scripture teaches. He turned out to believe that the Bible's prophecies were already complete, that Jesus had already returned. And he was just claiming that title, Bible-believing Christian. Would you like to be in the same camp as him or would you like some of those additional words to help uh, explain and teach of the truth of what Scripture gives to us? In response to the anti-denominational uh, times that we live in, one author writes uh, uh, positively in, in, in stating that denominational structures offer freedom of choice concerning belief and worship. So if you go to a church and you ask what their theology is, you can find out what they believe that scripture teaches and reveals. If a church is upfront uh, and can teach with conviction about their theology, then you can make an informed decision. And it causes you to be responsible and uh, show discernment in studying the scriptures yourself. Uh, the second statement was that, that a denomination enables a collaborative approach to such enterprises as mission and theological education. See, having a banner of, uh, of like-minded churches unites us in truth and we can labour together with other churches for God's kingdom, strengthening and encouraging one another, being a cloud of witnesses and professing the, the precious truths of the living word. 
To this, another author adds that denominational identity provides the basis for, for a coherent form of theological reflection and faithful living. And so this is the point. Titles and labels mean something. A mature believer is happy to be labeled. Happy to be labeled because the label conveys meaning about God's beautiful truth. What we mean uh, and, and to convey when we speak of God is found when we use these labels. To take seriously the words that God has given us and to aim to live faithfully and fully pleasing before him. See, Christians are always aiming to to convey the the things that we find, and one of them being the gospel of Jesus Christ by which we are saved. We are supposed to be equipped to be able to proclaim the good news of his death and resurrection for sinners, that souls would be one for the kingdom of God. Now, don't get confused here. We seek unity in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are orthodox in faith, while we congregate in different places due to belief and practice. We, of course, recognize true believers, and uh, we... Uh, uh, work alongside for the gospel proclamation in this world to see the kingdom advance. Yet this side of eternity, it is fair to say that denominations and labels are unavoidable. I'm also not saying that when you introduce yourself to somebody and you're wanting to share your faith and evangelize them, that you need to uh, uh, introduce yourself as a reformed Calvinistic Baptist or whatever labels and titles that you might be helping to articulate your theology, you might just use Bible-believing Christian in those times. I, I'm a Christian who believes that the Bible is the Word of God, but we're saying when somebody is a new convert and they're going to come into a church, we're going to need to be able to direct them to healthy churches and these titles are going to matter. Behind them is the truth of God's Word and even... See, even to be non-denominational, which is a, a, a popular uh, for, for some people to say they're non, non-denominational, uh, it, it's, it's ironic because what happens when you say that you're non-denominational, you're actually distancing yourself from others. You're causing a division when you say you're non-denominational. You cannot avoid the fact that there will be denominations. So our titles are going to matter wherever we attempt to speak the truth of God's word. And so this conference is a conference about being reformed Baptists by the conviction of Scripture through deep study and joyful labor of the Word, labor in the living truth of God, to study theological history, gleaning from the saints who came before us, walking the path before us. The Bible has been given so we can know truth. Christ himself is truth. Therefore, truth is to be known and explained and understood. A person isn't obnoxious or arrogant for stating truth because God has given it to us. In John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will to know it, and therefore you're able to tell it to others. In John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then Paul says in Ephesians 4, 15, that we are to speak the truth in love. Today, many people think that means make sure you're nice to everybody and don't ever upset anyone. Speak the truth in love will upset people at times because the truth does offend when we speak God's word. But yes, we speak it in love for the good of the person's soul that they might be redeemed and won into the kingdom of God. Listen to the words of Jeremiah in in chapter 6, verse 14. It says, They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace. Peace where there is no peace. The only peace that actually matters is truth-based peace. We aren't to have unity with darkness for the sake of unity. We aren't to have unity with false teachers for the sake of unity. So we do seek unity, of course, yet unity without truth is not true unity. Christians should want to belong to a church, therefore, where their leaders are convicted of the things of Scripture and able to teach them. Not washing them down and not uh, skipping over sections of Scripture just for the sake of some superficial unity. So yes, while our aim is to simply be Christians living in the world and making disciples, preaching the good news, there are times for titles, and this conference is such a time, that we might be equipped for God's service. I want to finish with a warning of immaturity of faith. Staying in a place of not knowing and not growing. It's given to us here by the author of Hebrews in chapter 5 saying, About this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. 
For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Did you hear it? You're supposed to be able to say, this is wrong, this is false teaching, this is evil, but this here is true and right. You are to be trained for such a task. God intends for it. That's what he would have you to do. God's plan is to grow you and mature you as a Christian. To have maturity of faith because it is he who has revealed himself to us. He has revealed to us his will. He has revealed to us the plans for his church. And he has given us shepherds and teachers. For what? To equip you with these same truths. So we're here with the conviction of truth. uh, Here to confess them as we do every Lord's Day, every Bible study, every discipleship conversation and Q&A. And so I, as the other speakers who are here, believe in the Reformed Baptist position to grow believers in maturity usefulness for the kingdom of God. So may this mini conference bless you and your families uh, in knowing the truth of God's word. May our fellowship be joyful. May we be even more fruitful as a result and serve our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's uh, bow and pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you today um, that your plan is to give us truth for us to know it and be able to tell it. Uh, Would you mature us? Would you strengthen us? And would you equip us for this very task, Lord? We thank you that it hasn't been left to us, Lord. You have come to us. You have given us the truth of your word. You have revealed who you are. And not just revealed, but you have brought salvation to us. You are a good and merciful God. We praise you. All glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.